So thank you very much, uh, Jim. Uh, my name is Jane Lewis. I'm uh, Hobart's Chancellor and Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology. And um, I'm delighted to be able to chair this debate tonight. Uh, universities are about uh, debate. They are about hearing about uh, different ideas. And uh, we've got an excellent panel of speakers um, that I'm going to introduce you to. Um, so our first speaker tonight will be uh, Jahangir Mohamed, uh, Chief Executive of Communica uh, Limited, a company that provides expertise, advice and training to organisations and lawyers on counter-terrorism and extremism laws and policy, as well as on management and uh, media. And I, I'm delighted he's been able to join us tonight. Um, he's come down from Manchester uh, for this event. Our next speaker will be Rupert Sutton. Um, Rupert's Director of Student Rights and uh, joined that organisation in 2011. Um, he holds a BA in War Studies from the University of Kent and an MA in Terrorism and Security from King's College. Um, and Rupert uh, will, uh, has joined us from London, so not quite so far, but uh, made it across town for tonight. Our third speaker will be uh, Abdullah Al Andalusi. He's, <laughs> close. Uh, he's an international speaker, thinker, and intellectual activist for Islam and Muslim affairs. His work involves explaining, demonstrating by rational argument um, the intellectual proofs for the Islamic belief system uh, and promoting the Islamic way of life. Um, and Islamic solutions for contemporary um, problems. And I'm delighted he's been able to uh, join us uh, tonight. He's been travelling today, so um, welcome. And uh, our final speaker at the last minute is uh, Dibyash uh, Anand, who's uh, head of our politics and international relation, uh, the relations uh, department. And um, uh, Dibyash is uh, a, a, an author, he's... Um, uh, interests lie uh, in all sorts of politics, but um, he has uh, written on Hindu nationalism in India and the politics of uh, fear. And uh, welcome and thank you, uh, Dibyesh, for um, uh, coming tonight. So um, the way this is going to work is that I'm going to ask each speaker to uh, spend about five minutes or so I think it says 7 to 10 here, I will hold them to time, giving us their thoughts on the, on the uh, debate tonight, which is should we promote or prevent, prevent, okay? And then there'll be an opportunity for questions from the uh, audience um, uh, before we uh, wrap up. So that's going to be the uh, order of business. Um, so if I can invite uh, Jahan here up. Over to you. Good evening and uh, assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Santa. Um, I, I was going to say a little bit about what prevent is because I think it's important to have that knowledge, but given that I've only got five minutes, I will do that in a question and answers. Um, I've uh, been talking and writing about prevent and warning about the dangers of prevent since before it actually became policy, and that's a long time. Uh, and I came at it from the point of view, somebody who's worked in local government, spent a lifetime on quality issues, putting into practice good isolation, <coughs> and building communities. And my initial thoughts were that this is going to lead to wholesale discrimination against the Muslim community, and erosion of rights, and therefore this will be counterproductive. And I must say, everything I said initially has come true um, when we see the reaction within the Muslim community to this. And um, that's not to say that, that you know, we need to accept that there is a real and genuine threat of violent attacks in this country. And um, even uh, extreme or bad ideas, and I'm using the word extreme in uh, quote. But the question we have to ask ourselves is prevent the best way to deal with those threats and the, uh, the very genuine security concerns that there are. And 
prevent, really, what I would say is prevent is only partly about dealing with security. So if you look at the uh, ideas, the background, the, where prevent originated from, yes, there is a security element from it, but there's also a theory, there are ideas behind it, and the question we have to ask ourselves is, are these ideas in themselves inherently racist, Islamophobic, and uh, uh, regressive? And I've spent a long time looking at those ideas um, with, within PREVENT. So the basic concept, and PREVENT is not just about terrorism, it's about ideas, it's about thought, and the definition of, uh, and it's about extremism as well. And the definition of extremism is partly political because it talks about fundamental British values, democracy, the rule of law. Uh, so that's a political part of the definition. And the second part of it has to do with violence. And these ideas, in essence, have come and were imported into this country from uh, by Tony Blair and emanate from um, uh, extremism is in the eye of the beholder, and I believe they, these ideas themselves emanate from extremist thought, neoconservatism, Christian Zionism in the United States. And uh, the basic uh, theory, and, you, uh, and have been brought in by Tony Blair and organizations such as the Henry Jackson Society, uh, the so co Social Cohesion, Centre for Social Cohesion, William Foundation, and these type of groups. And there's a whole network of funding for these type of uh, uh, right-wing groups in the United States that produce the ideas that many security experts latch on to. And there's two key documents that define, really, the ideas behind where PREVENT is now. They are produced by the RAND Corporation, uh, one is um, civil democratic Islam, and the other one is creating moderate Islamic networks. Um, these are both documents that have at their root the idea of reforming Islam itself. And you see this in the ideas of neoconservatives in the United States. So these, at the international level, they are about increased military intervention to force change in the Muslim world and to, to change the shape and image of Muslim countries into similar uh, societies as the West. So, war overseas and domestically, Cold War. So if you look at the ideas behind the treatment of Muslims within Europe and the erosion of rights, I don't have time to go into that, but uh, maybe we can pick up on them. You see that uh, this is the concept of treating Islam akin to communism, the green peril that's replaced the red peril, and therefore the ideas and thought of the Muslim world uh, and the Muslim communities in Europe have to change. And essentially, that's where PREVENT is now. It is no longer just a policy that has to do with idea, uh, violence. It's to do with ideas and thoughts. And it's now a duty, as has been pointed out, on every public sector worker to identify bad ideas and bad thoughts. The root concept behind uh, the PREVENT theory is it's not what the West does in the Muslim world that is the trigger for violence. It is what uh, Muslim thought is and Muslim ideas and Muslim theology. Now this concept is deeply Islamophobic. It comes from the Crusades. The same concept uh, occurred that violence, uh, where the Crusaders never looked at their violence, but they looked at the violence that was taking place to repulse the Crusaders. And they blamed it on the religion of Islam, on the Quran, on the Prophet Muhammad as a man of violence. This is embedded within the prevent theory. It's something called the conveyor belt theory. 
i.e. the Muslim who commits a act of violence is at this point, but the starting point is here. These bad ideas, thoughts, bad religion. So if you believe that is the cause of violence, uh, and we can talk about this in questions and answers, then the idea, then what you have to do is to root out those bad ideas and thoughts. And therefore, um, the prevent duty encourages that process. And if you look at the, the psychology behind it, the framework behind it, the guidance behind it, the training behind it, it is a very, very wide, broad concept that includes things like uh, grievance, uh, grievances in the Muslim world, um, if you're feeling a bit depressed, if you're feeling a bit sad, I've got the four 22 factors here, um, which have drawn up, been drawn up by um, psychologists, in essence. So these have been applied. And it's not surprising that uh, you're getting all of these cases. I don't want to go into the details of all these cases. Uh, I see a lot of them, but uh, you, you know, the cucumber case, you've had uh, all kinds of other cases. It's, it gives you that discretion. Public sector workers are now encouraged to look at the Muslim community and say, well, this might be a threat, therefore let's refer them. And uh, in essence, that's what's been happening. There have been over 6,795 referrals to the channel program since 2007. Only one in five of those has led to some kind of intervention, i.e. to correct the bad ideas, uh, to correct the bad political thoughts, bad associations. Uh, obviously, in some cases, that might be appropriate, but, you know, there is no information. That's a very large figure. And if you project that forward, last year the figures doubled from the previous year. And every year, in essence, the referrals have been doubling. If we project that forward for the next 10 years, you're looking at 20,000 people. It's a hell of a lot of people. And once you're referred, I'm told by teachers who've been on the program, people who've spoken to police officers, that you are not uh, Put on the crime register, police crime uh, uh, intelligence, but, but on the national intelligence database, and there's no way to get yourself off that. So there are real concerns uh, amongst legal circles about the criminalisation of young people, and that uh, giving somebody an intelligence file uh, to, uh, for the rest of their life, uh, and that will be with them whenever they, they progress. So. Rather than safeguarding, um, what we have is actually uh, not safeguarding. And discrimination, uh, most good safeguarding policies have the elimination of discrimination as one of the aspects of good safeguarding policy. I can talk a lot more about the lack of due process, the, right, the fact that parents don't have a right, uh, or the, there's no right to legal representation, in this, there's no right to challenge, and ultimately, this is a policy that is being dreamt up by non-Muslims, uh, applied by non-Muslims, the experts are non-Muslims, the Muslim community is no longer even consulted about this. So, there are real <coughs> elements of Islamophobia and supremacy uh, in this whole idea. No other community would accept that. Imagine if a Muslim <coughs> Uh, applied their ideas about Christianity and were responsible for uh, making judgments on the Christian uh, community. It would not be accepted. Thanks very much. I'm sure you're
Now, Prevent has a bad reputation these days. I don't think that can be denied. Um, an event we hosted in Parliament last year, um, speakers including the senior figure from the Higher Education Funding Council, um, as well as Professor Jeff Petz, uh, Vice Chancellor of this university, um, agreed that while most people they've spoken to accepted the need for a strategy um, and agreed that the process is in place, they'd often switch off once they heard the word prevent um, and the prevent itself had become something of a toxic brand, um, something which I think Jahangir's speech um, kind of covered there. Um, now, I mean, since the imposition of the statutory prevent duty for public bodies last year, there's also been a steady stream of news stories alleging bad practice, which actually often fail to tell the full story, um, malign the, the entire strategy as a whole for um, poor train, poorly trained professionals. Um, and we've seen at least one of those examples mentioned tonight. Um, and the poor reporting of these cases and others, something really no other safeguarding program um, sees when experts turn down referrals, um, is no doubt, I think, a significant factor in the loss of trust in the strategy. Now, um, which, as um, we've seen over the, over the last few months, there's not only been an ongoing campaign organised by the NUS, uh, or at least a faction within the NUS, uh, which encourages students to boycott prevent um, spreads false claims about students being arrested, um, claims to prevent targets you simply for opposing foreign policy, um, as well as the, the accusations of racism, Islamophobia and white supremacism you've heard tonight. Um, now, there's simply no evidence that Prevent is a racist strategy. Training materials, guidance, documents, and all officials that you talk to will all clearly identify that it works towards all forms of extremism. Um, and in fact, the person who's highlighted that it targets Muslims the most in this room is, is Jahangir. Um, the most we hear about Prevent targeting Muslims and Islam comes from the people who are trying to undermine it, not the people implementing it. Now, in addition to that, these criticisms also fail to take into account the clear need for safeguarding policies to be put in place for those at risk of radicalisation, both by the government and by public bodies. Now, the growth of the conflict in Syria has seen hundreds of pe young people seek to travel overseas to join terrorist groups. And just over the weekend, it was reported that a young man who studied at this university was among those. Um, Mohammed Jakar Ali is believed to have studied here for a term in 2013 before travelling to Syria to become, in his own words, a suicide bomber and fighter. Now, Several months later, his parents were informed by police that pictures of his corpse had been posted on Facebook after he was killed in an explosion. Now, Ali's life has parallels to that of another teenage suicide bomber who died nearly 10 years earlier. Um, Hasib Hussain killed 13 people on 7-7, not far from here, actually, on Tavistock Square. Um, he'd never come to the attention of the police, um, yet had clearly become radicalised enough to murder his fellow citizens. When police investigated his background, they found that while he was a model student, his school books were littered with supportive comments about Al-Qaeda, and that he would openly talk about his support for the group. Now, this isn't criminal behaviour, and the police were not called. Um, yet it's possible that Hussein could have been diverted away from this part had the processes that exist today been in place. The same is true of Ali, uh, and could also be suggested in the case of Roshan Chowdhury, who told police after her arrest for the attempted murder of Labour MP Stephen Timms uh, that she dropped out of King's College London prior her attack for a number of reasons, um, including that uh, they were involved in things where they worked against the Muslims. Now, she stated in her interviews with the police that the university had been aware of her plans to drop out. Um, and this raises the question of whether staff who came into contact with her before she left university and carried out her attack could have been better trained to identify her increasing radicalism. While it's always easy to, to suggest that more could be done in hindsight, had Muhammad Jaka Ali or Roshan Chowdhury's increasingly extreme views and vulnerability to those views been spotted earlier by staff trained to be aware of these issues, it's possible they could have been referred to prevent uh, you know, through to the channel program um, instead of wasting their lives in the way that they did. Now, helping frontline staff in public bodies who have the most, you know, the most contact with these people often, um, like before they harm others or commit other terrorism offences, is not about criminalising people for their views, but providing support before they criminalise themselves or harm others. And that's the way that we have to look at prevent that rather than seeking to criminalise ideology, you're seeking to help people who might at some point go on and commit a criminal offence and waste their lives. This goes to the heart of what Prevent is. Um, and I think for that reason, it's vital that students support its work. They don't have to promote it. They just have to not undermine it. Um, I mean, I think that I'll stop there because I don't have, I have to leave early. Um, and I think it's important we get as much time for questions and answers on this as, um, as possible. Um, particularly following what happened over the weekend with one of the speakers pulling out claiming that he'd been gagged by Prevent. 
um, when actually he'd simply been asked to sign up to the Union Equality and Diversity Policy. Now, given his claims in The Independent on Friday that um, he wouldn't be allowed to talk about, um, and I quote, complaints by young Muslim men that they've been radicalised because of MIF, MI5 harassment, um, I think that we should make sure we address that in the community. Um, thank you. Uh, invite uh, Abdullah up to um, give us his thoughts. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of God be upon you all. Good evening to you all. I'd like to thank the <coughs> Westminster Student Union for hosting this debate on a high topical issue that I believe needs to be discussed more in wider society. In 1950s and 1960s uh, USA, the black civil rights movement launched to get African Americans the right to equality under the law. However, what most people don't realize today is that the US Constitution had been amended 100 years prior to that, guaranteeing already uh, European Americans who are called whites, I call them European Americans, if you're gonna call African Americans the same, then <laughs> equality there. So European Americans and African Americans already had full equality under the US Constitution, including the right to full suffrage, i.e. voting. How could African Americans then claim discrimination if they were under the same laws and what everyone was equal under the law? Well, it's quite simple. The discrimination was in the making of overreaching election laws, then the selective implementation of these laws upon African Americans. The southern states made general laws setting high registration uh, requirements for, for voters then disproportionately applied it on the African-American voters and relaxed that implementation on European-American voters so that African-American voters, would, most of them, would not be able to vote. No one today would dare say that the African-Americans back then just liked moaning about persecution and they were just falsely playing the victim. After all, the laws back then were equal, in theory, on both European-Americans and African-Americans. However, back then, this is precisely what was argued by many politicians and pundits, even some African-American pundits who were propped up by the other side. We all know now that that was discrimination. And this discrimination led, to predict led predictably to high African-American dissatisfaction and anger, causing many to create a mainstream peaceful political movement, but also a much smaller minority initiating a violent movement. Likewise, in England, a hundred years ago, the suffragists were the mainstream movement of women who peacefully campaigned against discrimination in UK law that denied women the right to vote. But there, was also, there also existed a minority of women called the suffragettes who were engaged in terrorism to achieve the same goal. Ultimately, the solution to terrorism in those situations was redressing the grievances by establishing justice and permitting a healthy, peaceful, avenue for those movements, for the peaceful movements to flourish. Now, we all want to prevent terrorism. We all want to see the end of, to the use of this despicable methodology and the suffering of innocent people affected by it. The question here today, though, is, is the UK's government agenda or program called Prevent a just and efficacious solution? There already exists many measures in law and programs such as assessing the psychology, the, psychology the, the mentality of students that could already be applied to root out people who are at danger of either suicide or committing violence. We already have these laws, we already have these measures. Teachers are well equipped to deal with this. Now the reason why I said that the prevent is, is not, uh, I'm gonna say prevent is not just and efficacious, is because it doesn't deal with establishing justice, um, which can only be the solution to the scourge of terrorism because establishing justice and a solution to terrorism are one and the same thing. The head of MI5, Baroness Manningham Buller said, our involvement in Iraq, for want of a better word, radicalized a whole generation of young people, some of them British citizens, who saw our involvement in Iraq on top of our involvement in, Af in Afghanistan as being an attack on Islam. She then corrected herself saying, not just a whole generation, but some young people. However, the UK government have chosen to use prevent as a blunt instrument against belief and ideology, instead of dealing with the injustices of foreign policy and some domestic policies. Or in a permitting minority communities to use their own belief systems and vocal voices to contest terrorism amongst themselves, 
even if those beliefs are not in line with the state ideology of secular liberalism. Prevent now uses the unproven theory of the conveyor belt theory to terrorism, citing ideology as the leading factor that causes terrorism. This theory is not only pr not proven, but rejected by the vast majority of academics, ex-secret service professionals, analysts, and um, all the documented claims of the terrorists themselves. Yet for some reason, Prevent is still insistently built on this theory, which provides a convenient pretext to target political dissent and legitimate religious beliefs. It is common today to find politicians, securocrats, right-wing media, and neoconservatives shutting down any challenge to this theory by claiming that anyone who cites injustice and grievance as a cause of terrorism is justifying it. Because they argue that the only person to be blamed is the free-willed individual themselves who possesses full moral responsibility that commits the crime. Any claim that any other causes are to blame or share some kind of responsibility, they say is denying the criminal's personal culpability in their view. However, in the same breath, these very same uh, securocrats, neocons and, and politicians unashamedly blame ideology and hate preachers for the actions of those same free-willed, morally responsible individuals who make the individual choice to commit acts of terrorism. To such people, I'd like to cite the founder of secular liberalism, John Locke's own response to such an argument. He says, I quote, if men enter into seditious conspiracies, it is not religion that inspires them to their meetings. Just and moderate governments everywhere are quiet, everywhere safe, but oppression rages, raises ferments and makes men struggle to cast off an uneasy and tyrannical yoke. I know that seditions are very frequently raised upon pretense of religion, but it is as true that for religious subjects are frequently ill-treated and live miserably. Believe me, the stirs that are made proceed not from any peculiar temper of this or that church, we see he means in religious interpretation, or religious society, but from the common disposition of all mankind. There is only one thing that gathers people into seditious commotions, and that is oppression. Is John Locke now a jihadi sympathizer? Or should we call him jihadi John Locke? Prevent is unjust and counterproductive. The absurdity of today's government program on Prevent can be seen if we were to ask the question, what if the 1950s and 60s American government implemented a Prevent agenda to stop terrorism of a minority of civil rights activists? Would they argue, using the logic behind today's Prevent, that the belief in black solidarity or the belief in black equality with whites is a conveyor belt to terrorism? Would they seek to stop African Americans from believing in those things because they are risk factors or that they play a role in radicalization? What if the British government implemented Prevent to stamp out the suffragette terrorism 100 years ago? Would they attempt to de-radicalize women by telling women that they shouldn't believe that women deserve the equal right to vote because belief in the equal right to vote of women is a radicalizing factor in that causes terrorism? Do you think if the US and British government did that, it would have reduced grievances behind black nationalist and feminist terrorism or exacerbated them. You decide. Now, the Quran teaches Muslims to repel evil with good and that even in the face of the worst injustices, whether torture of Muslims, invasions, drones and aerial bombardments sanctioned by the militants that head some Western governments, Muslims should never compromise our principles and retaliate in like manner. Unlike secular liberalism's war philosophies, Islam contains no justification for terrorism under any circumstance, unlike secular liberalism's belief in the supreme emergency exemption, which allows uh, secular liberals to justify bombing civilians if they believe it will help them win the war. And Winston Churchill was cited as an example. Islam, we reject that um, uh, philosophy and we reject the ideology behind that, that justification. But prevent ends up serving to silence religious voices that, say, that um, say that there is no justification for terrorism in Islam. And they end up silencing the strongest critics of terrorism. But they claim that they do this because these critics are quote unquote fascists, without defining what the term fascism even means, but inadvertently admitting that the prevention of violence isn't the main factor here. Prevent is unjust because it effectively constitutes the invasion of people's common rights here in the UK to adopt religious opinions freely without sanction or loss of rights, with the government deciding which opinions are heretical or extremist in the modern uh, language and which are not. 
This leads us to the absurd yet horrifying situation of a secular state intervening and imposing in the religious life of a community and unilaterally defining what is acceptable religious beliefs for its citizens to hold. Studies have already shown that prevent subjects, children of, of minorities, university students, private citizens and charity organizations to discrimination and disproportionate implementation of restrictions against them due to their religious beliefs and affiliations. We all know of the school children that have faced traumatic police interrogations for mispronouncing words, speaking about Palestine, or even merely demonstrating religiosity, and those uh, reports haven't been exaggerated. But since we're at university, I'd like to focus on one particular example. People who are unilaterally declared by the government or an unelected media pundit to be extremists face discriminatory treatment. When a student Islamic society wishes to invite a, a speaker to give a lecture, if a Muslim speaker has been excommunicated by the powers that be as a quote-unquote extremist, the UK government demands that universities must ensure that these speakers face some sort of challenge in the form of a partial and restricted platform shared with a minder who will counter the speaker's points. However, if someone like Maram Namazi, an atheist and strong critic of Islam and Muslims, wants to speak at the univer at a university, sh uh, 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 which she will end up being challenged by students in the audience, this is rightly denounced as preventing her right to give an unrestricted lecture. If one person isn't allowed to speak without a political minder on their platform, then either everyone should be treated the same or no one should be treated like that. If you say some, uh, uh, some should, despite the fact they're not criminals, but not others, then you've created a second class of citizens. Prevent is not efficacious because it quite simply isn't just. Its main focus is not preventing terrorism, but assimilation of a cultural minority in the UK and silencing political dissent within it, goals of which can be found discussed by David Cameron, Michael Gove, Henry Shawcross, uh, and a coterie of other political figures, including especially Douglas Murray, Associate Director of the neoconservative Henry Jackson Society, which supports the ironically named Student Rights Organization. Prevent therefore only serves to exacerbate grievances and tacitly endorses Islamophobia and the perception of Muslims as a threat. This ends up only further um, increasing hate and violence in the society against people of all creeds and backgrounds. Thank you. Thank you to all and thank you to Student Union for organizing this. As you know, I'm the last minute speaker here, and I can't ba can barely read my own handwriting. But much of it was prompted by my own thought, but also listening to other speakers. So in a sense, I will be partly reacting to it, and I guess that's the nature of debate here. I mean, I'm someone, let me make it very clear, I'm not representing anyone. I'm only speaking as a public intellectual who's interested in the welfare of students, who's interested in the kind of just and democratic society that we should be aiming for, and someone who's dis deeply disturbed by strategies such as prevent that demonize communities, that put people under surveillance, that are used selectively against certain kind of people and individuals, and that do not actually help, possibly, in preventing acts of violence. So for me, in a sense, prevent and the kind of strategy that prevent adopts, we see that it's part of counter-terrorism strategy, it's part of counter-radicalization, but remember in 1960s and 70s, radicalization is what universities are all about. Radical politics implied, dealing with issues that would challenge the status quo. At the same time, so in that sense, um, let me make it very clear, I have my own anxieties with and skepticism of the strategies such as prevent. We may find that even BDS, let's say boycott, divestment, and sanctions kind of a movement that exists among students and amongst others against Israeli apartheid might be seen as part of extremism and we could face challenge there. So I'm just saying that we should be aware that there are political challenges and the state uses prevent and these kind of strategies to domesticate public opinion and to domestic dissent. There's no doubt about it. But my problem also is with a blanket critique of prevent. Again, I'm not that much interested in prevent, but there's a blanket critique of what uh, two speakers specifically talked about it and they talked of West and Muslim world, they talked of West and Islam and very much focusing on what I would call of Call, uh, talk about a certain signs of victimization. Let me deal with that. So, in a sense, it's very clear that prevent has a problem. But critiques of prevent also are rather lazy, very generalistic, stereotypical, and often sensationalist. For instance, West versus Islam. 
majority of the world is not West, majority of the world is not Islam. I understand you're talking UK context, but in UK also there are different kinds of communities that exist. The racism that uh, uh, the last speaker was talking about refers to, it exists here also. So when we are trying to challenge Islamophobia, often when you listen to critics of prevent, they almost never associate the experience that Muslims have because of Islamophobic policies with experiences of other kinds of racism in UK context. So somehow Muslims are the chosen people, but chosen people to be victimized. When you might find that there are various kinds of people who get victimized along race lines, gender lines, sexuality lines, religion lines. So right? In a sense, this West versus Islam thing is problematic. And I said, so experience of Muslims in today's context, for instance, as I prevent, is not radically different from experience of many other victims of racism in the UK today. And if we really want to challenge the kind of bigotry or kind of possible policy that uh, prevent encourages, we need to see it in the solidarity beyond Muslims and solidarity with other victimized uh, communities. British values, I know, I'm someone who doesn't like any kind of value, let me make it very clear. And I was listening to uh, talking about British values and you talked of Tony Blair and, you know, uh, and, well, uh, and the kind of... Uh, Tony Blair being a problematic teacher, of course. Uh, re British values being having some kind of basis in crusades and everything else. I mean, talk of democracy, democratic values, individual liberty, respect for others, regardless of the faith. And what was the fourth one? There was something similar, right? And, uh, oh, rule of law. Now, of course, I'm also somewhat politically, I'm an anarchist. I also believe that rule of law is often used for purpose of power. But let's not make, let's not be, let, if we, if we believe that somehow Muslims in this country are being victimized, and the first speaker talked about, imagine where Muslims impose this kind of policy on others. Go to any other Muslim majority countries. They exist. The ways in which, for instance, Christians get treated in Muslim majority countries like Pakistan is not that different from the way in which Muslims get treated in Buddhist majority Burma, Rohingya. The way in which Muslims and Christians get treated in Hindu majority India, and the way in which Muslims get and others get treated here. So sometimes when we listen to critics of uh, prevent, we see that sense of stereotype of West versus Muslims, where Muslims are the only victims, and somehow if Islam was there, everything would be resolved. And let's talk of the last speaker when he was talking of you know, Islamic justice and everything. I would like to ask, what would happen to someone like me, who's atheist and gay, in the kind of society he imagines? I would be very interested in discussing that part, because... When we talk of bigotry, when we talk of violence, when we talk of demonization of community, let's keep in mind that the multiple sources of bigotry in this country, and I'm not saying prevent big with any of it, but we'll come back to you. you can, you'll have time to answer my question. No, 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 I will not get time there. Now, in terms of, uh, when we look at uh, acts of violence, extremism, terrorism, the reality is majority of, them, of that here in Western context, the UK context is not done by Muslims. It's done by men. Take example, not only UK context, but outside Syria. You look at Assad's militia, Assad's army, mostly men. You look at ISIS, mostly men. I think all of them men, most of them. You look at uh, uh, Al Nusra, almost all men. You look at Russians who are fighting their men. You look at security advice in UK, France, all men. So how come when we talk of extremism and violent extremism, we are talking about Muslims and other communities when the main and primary identity that is responsible is certain notions of masculinity? If you want to eradicate it, why not eradicate men? Or at least <laughs> eradicate certain notions of masculinity, which none of us seem to be challenging. Well, at least I'm challenging it, but many of the speakers don't seem to be challenging it. Yeah. Now, justice is crucial. Iraq war is important. But very interesting when we talk of Iraq war and connection, I'm sure there's connection. But when we also talk of Iraq war today, the kind of sectarianism that exists, the kind of sectarianism that is also existing amongst, let's say, Muslim community here where Iraq war is seen as a trauma, but largely for Sunnis, without realizing and without recognizing that Saddam Hussein was very brutal and genocidal against Kurdish people. It was, he was genocidal against the Shias. So sometimes when we talk about Iraq war being responsible for radicalization of people, we forget the sectarian elements there. For me, I think what Saudi Arabia is doing in Yemen is more radicalizing. We hardly talk of it. Have we seen Muslim community in UK going on protests against Saudi Arabia for bombing? Have we seen Many other people talking about foreign against foreign intervention. When one of the biggest examples of foreign intervention today is in Yemen, we hardly see that. 
if we see that, we realize selectivity. We select not only selectivity in terms of seeing one set of the victim, but also selective way in which we have empathy for the other. To conclude, and rather to summarize in one and a half minutes before Jane gets up, let's talk of the uh, role of university, because of course we are talking of university context, right? Uh, again, freedom. Universities are meant to de encourage debate and discuss uh, free thought. But we also have duty of care. So when, for instance, if a particular society, and uh, because the last speaker talked about Islamic society, particularly didn't talk at it, if a particular society, Islamic society, whatever society it's called in our university, it invites a speaker known for homophobia, known for hate speech, at one point in time, let's say, in a month, when it's LGBT month, do we see it simply as free speech, or do we see it as a very selective political move because there's a student union election going on, and there's also LGBT month? The basic thing that people need to understand is when we exercise our freedom of speech is also a certain sense of responsibility and duty of care. If I don't like you, if I don't like you, does not imply that I have to say it in a particular manner when you're vulnerable? So for instance, let's say if it's a time of religious celebration and that is the time when I choose to critique the religion, I think it's highly insensitive. It's not about freedom of speech. So I do think universities have a duty of care primarily. It is a source of freedom, yes. It's also a duty of care. Because, and duty of care, I can imagine, in any kind of setup like university, is not easy to manage because you may want something and she may want something and third person may want something, right? In a sense, I do realize that university are spaces where progressive values should be encouraged, where racism and all kinds of bigotry should be challenged. But we also need to understand that if students and staff, I'm not saying that students are vulnerable to being more problematic than us. If students stuff, if we misuse or use certain kind of ideas and certain kind of speakers to provoke others and to dehumanize others, I'm sorry, there should be limited space for that. So basic principle I would adopt is let us work for ideologies that humanize rather than dehumanize. And that is crucial. I don't think prevent, promote that kind of... Uh, anti-dehumanization, but I also don't think that just saying, criticizing, prevent, and not doing anything else would avoid that kind of dehumanization. Thank you very much. Well, uh, plenty to think about there, I think, uh, a number of different strands which you can take forward. Um, I'm very pleased to uh, open the floor uh, for questions. Um, if you could put up your hand, and uh, if you would like to indicate the speaker that you would like to respond, um, then that would also be helpful. This gentleman here is the first person. Yeah, I'd just like to address, uh, after the quick you mentioned Marion Namazi, who's having a talk today, actually, um, and you said apparently she was accepted because she's like a secular atheist uh, speaker, but actually, Marion Namazi, the same person who was shut down by a bunch of uh, students at Goldsmiths. That was, uh, that, that was the incident I was actually referring to in, the, in my discussion. I said that she was challenged by members of the audience and she wasn't allowed she wasn't to... Uh, let, let, let me explain. Let me explain. She wasn't allowed an unrestricted lecture where she wasn't interrupted. That's what I said very, very clearly. So, um, and I, am, I, was, I oppose that. I think she should have an unrestricted lecture. Like everybody else should have an unrestricted lecture without having a political minder to be there to holding their hand and... Uh, uh, treating that person like a second-class citizen, okay? So I'm actually for um, open speech for everyone, even those who are the st strongest critics of uh, Islam. I've actually, my organization has actually tried to, uh, well, actually work with the LS, um, LSE uh, Islamic Society to actually hold a debate with Mary Namazi, invite inviting her to express her opinions and ideas. Um, she didn't take us up on that offer, but we've tried to get and even give her a platform as well. So we don't... Um, we're not against open speech, but I'd like to answer the question that was posed to me by um, m the esteemed last speaker. So um, he basically asked, I think asked perhaps, what would happen to a, um, a gay atheist under the kind of state that we, what we envision? Well, short answer, nothing. Long answer, nothing. I mean, it's nothing going to be happening to someone who's an atheist. We had atheists in, in under three dynasties of Islamic rule for 1,300 years. We had public debates with, we have these uh, great, um, amazing records of public debates with atheists criticizing religion, criticizing Islam. St. John of Damascus was a Catholic. He said that Islam came from Satan and he published his book in, Dama well, not in Damascus, but in the Levant under Islamic rule. Nothing happened to him. So there's no, and as for 
the issue of being gay, well, this was actually an invention of, uh, I think, uh, 19th century Germany, a German uh, thinker, and it spread throughout Europe. They adopted it as, as an idea of uh, sexual identification and politics and stratification. It caused uh, people to discriminate against people who were labelled by it, whereas in Islamic law and un understanding, we don't discriminate people by sexuality. So you could be homosexual, bisexual, well, actually there's no such thing as bisexual, homosexual, heterosexual. In Islamic law, everyone's just taken as human beings. No one really, you're not judged or punished for your orientation uh, or, or what you do. It you love, you or what you, uh, <laughs> well, I, 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 would, I would probably call the police. <laughs> I, I would I would probably I would probably call the police for being uh, for being forced <laughs> if I if that was the case. But uh, but I'm saying what you do in the privacy of your own home is is up to you. Uh, in in the, you're not punished by that. Of course you can't have sex in public in the UK either uh, if you if you discount certain parks. But you can't do that. So Islamic law is no real, is no real different in its application to British law in that matter. Well, no, it's, a, it's the historical, we have historical precedence for it. Um, wait, wait, I, I didn't actually finish my, finish my point. I also wanted to address what that, the, the reason behind that question. Um, is my right, to pre, uh, is it based on a prerequisite of whether you agree with my political vision or not? So if I was to say, I don't know, unicorns should be hung, drawn and quartered, <laughs> let's just say, for example, right? Um, and you say, I find it disgusting. Well, then you, and you don't deserve any rights, Abdullah. Well, then that's wrong. You see, as long as everyone obeys the law in this country and you don't incite homophobia, in America it's not illegal, but in here you don't incite homophobia, you don't incite um, sexism, you don't incite, uh, there's, there's laws in place, then, then you can say what you want. We don't need new laws, we don't need prevent, we don't need neoconservatism, we don't need muscular liberalism. So that's, my, that's the only other thing I'm, I'm arguing is we shouldn't be subject to an inquisition before we are entitled to our rights. That's my point. Brief point. I mean, there's an assumption that Muslims themselves are not um, discriminated against and uh, their rights abused in Muslim countries. They are, and they have been for centuries, and more Muslims have been locked up and persecuted in Muslim countries than other minorities, and that's been the case for a long time. Secondly, on the issue of, you know, ha having a uh, person to speak opposing the view that you've just spoken about, you know, this is counter to the whole history of, uh, of equality and racism. Imagine, you, before you had Malcolm X speaking in a British university, you had to have the Ku Klux Klan or the white supremacist government at that time, spe uh, or, the you know, South African government. or South African government, uh, or even with Prevent. The view on Prevent is in mainstream. It has been in the media for 10 years. The mainstream view of prevent is everywhere. What you never hear is the other view. And, 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 Rupert, and Rupert actually dismisses people who are impacted by prevent, as do many people who are supporting it. Yesterday, Richard Kemp, on, uh, the other day on a, in a radio program, dismissed the suffering of the woman who had been involved in the cucumber case. Now, you tell me, not only are Muslims uh, supposed to accept that this theory uh, is imposed on them by others, they have no role to be consulted about it, they have no role in the implementation of it, they have no role in the criticism of it, but even their feelings about it are marginalised and dismissed. If that is not an indication of a supremacist ideology, then what is? Thank you very much. I'm going to allow Rupert a very quick comment and then I really do want to take some more questions. Yeah, I'll just come in very quickly. I mean, I think that um, the comment about political minders being on platforms, I mean, essentially what you're referring to there is people who disagree with you. Um, that that's what debate is at a university. If we're going to talk about these issues at a university, we should make sure that uh, when we do talk about them, that we actually have a debate rather than just one person saying, well, this is what you should think. Um, and I mean, if we go to um, the talk of prevent being imposed on people on the community not being uh, consulted by it, again, I think that comes down to the fact that you're not being consulted on it, that you're unhappy about. And I think that actually there have been a large number of people that have appeared before select committees in the Commons talking about these issues, consulting the policy before it went into, um, you know, into law. Um, all of these things are consulted 
prior to In that. 2007, they were so consulted, but gradually the Muslim involvement in Prevent has been reduced to only those people uh, who support it and to organisations like the Henry Jackson Society. But again, and you others. just need so, you in the No, 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 it's not. I mean, that's the mainstream view of the Muslim community. Right, I think this gentleman here had a question. Sir? I mean, should we take together a few questions or? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, uh, just quickly, uh, I mean, the aim of prevent essentially is to prevent people from being drawn into terrorism. Um, it's always difficult to say that somebody wouldn't have gone on to commit a, an offence because you're essentially trying to prove a negative there. Um, but what's important is that, um, that the strategy as a whole across the country is able to help people within different local government sectors, within universities, within schools. If they do have concerns about somebody and they think they might be at risk, they can say, well, these are the signs that I've been told to look out for. I can speak to somebody who's professional in these issues. Um, and then we can kind of make a decision on whether or not they might need any support. Okay, I've got a question at the back, very back. Um, I actually did the prevent workshop today, and I'm not completely for or against prevent. I think there lies a real danger in posing prevent as a direct, directly being anti-Islam. I didn't take that away from it at all. And actually, terrorism was defined in the workshop as it can be something linked to religion, it can be something linked to the far right. It wasn't, you know prevent is about being anti-Islam. So I think posing that, there might some danger in doing that and some un like unnecessary um, negativity also. I think if you don't want to prevent, you've got to start thinking about what you want to put in place of it. Because clearly we've got issues in the country around terrorism. What are we going to do to fight that I mean, I think, I think you're exactly right. I think the people that talk about the far-right threat um, that we face the least in this country are the people like Abdullah and, and Jahangir, who basically want to pre present this as an attack on I'm the sorry, Muslim I community. Sorry, I speak about far-right um, all the time. I just did some training on it last week. Okay. Yeah. Right, um, I think yes. Um, firstly... It, the, when I say political mind, it's not just people disagree with us. My organisation is called the Muslim Debate Initiative. We... If we set up debates purposely to do debates. So I have no problem with debates. It's when you're invited to a lecture and this, and this new measure's coming in will say that you can't do this lecture unless someone basically is also on that platform basically to hold your hand and to ensure that you're challenged. Then it becomes a minder. See, if it's forced, then it's a minder. It's not just someone who disagrees. So I'm all for disagreement in a debate. But if you're, if you're up for it, if people say, well, what's wrong with debate then? I say, great. Then every one of you, any one of, any speaker from, uh, your group or others, then also has to face a, my, a challenge on their platform with someone they have to share it with by force, but not by force, but by legal requirement then as well. Either we do it for everyone or we do it for no one. But you have to be consistent. And as for the issue of um, whether Prevent is anti-Islam or not, the issue is if you look at, I mean, sure, of course, the Prevent training, and there's it was some leaked documents as well about what the Prevent training looks at as well. And also you see anti-extremism uh, discussions in other countries, but also more specifically, the kind of um, telltale signs of radicalization, sudden religiosity, for example, or discussion of international affairs. Um, when you see these things being mentioned as w you know, risks or warning signs, then I would very much say that whoever inserted those things as risk, uh, issues of risk, then that is where the anti-religious uh, belief element comes in or anti-Islamic belief comes into it. Because a Muslim should have the right to, if they were not religious and they want to be religious, they should do that without being um, harassed or viewed with suspicion. And as all the intelligence agencies say, there is no profile for a terrorist. There are terrorists who basically, a couple of weeks beforehand, they were uh, um, owning a bar and so on, which that sells alcohol and so on. That as well, that there is no well, exactly. Then, then what can you look out for? Then that's my point. If there is no profile, you just refute your own point. If there is no profile, then what are you actually looking out for? Someone who's human? <laughs> You're saying that the prevent strategy lists these things linking to terrorism. When it doesn't, it actually opens a space for people to give their views on what they would view as terrorism. Well, I, I actually, sorry, sorry. Can the, the, I just ask the there, is, so there, was a, there was a point you mentioned. You said, what should we replace prevent with? We already had measures where teachers are, tra are, are trained, teachers are trained to see if any of their students are psychologically disturbed 
or they have any issues that might um, indicate they might be violent in any way, shape or form, to either self-harm or otherwise, for, for decades we've already had measures where teachers look out for those students and you get social services, you get people involved. You don't need new things. We have laws that ban hate, we have laws that ban support of terrorism and uh, incitement of terrorism. You don't need prevent. And the reason why you said they want to prevent um, is, I think, is something else than, than just those things. Can we I have I measures for them already. Thank you. Could we allow this uh, gentleman to make his point and ask his question? Actually, we are all here sitting talking about extremism, terrorism, or uh, um, radicalization. And the problem with this is that even our government, and including our respected uh, uh, speakers, didn't really clarify what is extremism, what is radicalization. You are, even our government is not really uh, sure to define that term because probably they are scared of their own definition. Maybe they will fit in their own definition of extremism or any kind of thing. So I just wanted to clarify what do we really mean by that? Uh, yeah, like I'll, ad I'll address that by answering that question. My guess is that on the training you never learnt about Christian extremism, Jewish extremism, Hindu extremism. But Islam is what I think about. Uh, no, no it, 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 I've seen the training and I know others who've been on the training, okay. and I know what gets discussed, right? Far right, why do you call it far right? Far right political. Why? Why, if you are being consistent and not discriminating, you would call it Christian extremism. Britain first carry crosses, they carry Bibles, they use passages in the Bible, yeah? EDL, similar. Uh, BNP, the founder of uh, the one, uh, the person who's had a key influence in all three organisations, is a character called Jim Dowson. Jim Dowson was a minister who learnt a lot of his uh, ideas from the United States. He was a marketer. He was a fundraiser. So even in the categorisation of groups, there's no uh, there's no equality. My guess is. And I, I see, I do risk, risk assessments, I see risk assessments. My guess is when universities like this are doing risk assessments, they are probably looking at speakers like uh, Abdullah and myself uh, and seeing what their views and ideas are. Uh, I would, would uh, like to um, probably bet that nobody checked what Rupert's organisation, the Henry Jackson Society, whether what their ideas and values were, are, or whether they are extreme. Can I just say that because we, we, we treat all speakers exactly the same and we have got into trouble. And I know Jim has given us how we got into trouble, so treat me all speakers the same. Um, CBS, yeah. and then very quickly, Ruth. Yeah, so in a sense, uh, going back to your question, see, the problem is, of course, no, I understand that the training you may have got did not specifically refer to Muslims and all of that, but the reality seems to be in this country that majority of people who suffer, and, and we have to respect that experience, happen to be Muslims. So even when if pre prevent strategy claims not to target one community, but majority of victims of that strategy have been Muslims, right? In a sense, we have to respect that angle. But at the same time, we also have to respect, and this is the kind of mansplaining that goes on, that if if you felt that it did not refer to Muslims, then you have the right to feel that and no one who has more experience of dealing with prevent should tell you that your experience is less valid than his experience. And this is the kind of you know, sort of uh, uh, speaking about that goes on when we talk of these things by the state and those who oppose it both. In terms of how to tackle an extremism, look, actually it's very difficult to define any kind of extremism. Because extremism assumes it's an extreme version of something. Now, people may argue, for instance, that Hindu nationalism that exists is not actually truly Hindu. ISIS is not truly Islamic. Uh, the Zionism is not truly Judaism. Those are fine debates to be had. But the reality is we also have to listen to those who commit violence. Do they use Hinduism? In case of Hindu nationalists, they do use Hindu. They claim that they're Hindus. ISIS, does it use Islam? Does it claim to be more Muslim than anyone here, they do claim that. Now, we may argue that they're not true Muslim, they're not true Hindu, but the reality is they're using or misusing the religion. And in that context, the debate is as much within communities as it between communities, and that's very crucial. And regarding terms, I mean, I do feel that overall violence has to be challenged, but violence cannot be challenged if we only look at 
particular communities and how they're being victimized. That's why I kept saying that it's very important that we come up with ideologies and ideas that challenge dehumanization at every level. The conveyor belt idea is very interesting. It's very, it's very that you know, if you somehow become religious, then you become more religious, then you become violent, sorry, extremist, then you become violent. These are problematic ones. But we also have to understand that bigotry of certain kind and violence often go together. And my own work has been Hindu nationalism and the ways in which the majority community, thinking that Muslims are pests, Christians are a problem, often then justifies and legitimizes violence against Muslims. Um, I want to give over to yeah, I, I just wanted to come very quickly to uh, a couple of points. Um, first of which is, is the kind of distinction between the far right and, and Christian um, extremism. I think actually should probably be seen as, as two distinct things. So, for example, Britain First, I would say, are a far right group that is essentially uh, that is, a, is a Christian um, extremist group. But there are a number of far right groups, uh, neo Nazi organizations like National Action, for example, which um, don't uh, couch their extremism in those terms. They couch their extremism in national socialist terms and it's important that if you are going to, to talk about these things that you do make a distinction so for example when people say uh, the IRA were Catholics therefore they were Catholic terrorists well actually the IRA were Catholics the terrorists who happened to be also Catholic, their Catholicism informed their violence, but it wasn't the reason behind their violence. Um, and so in the case of we call far-right groups far-right groups because they are far-right political organisations. When Christian extremists like Britain first appear, we should call them Christian extremists. The same as happens in the US when often you do see Christian extremists carry out terror attacks that aren't called terrorist attacks. Um, but my kind of wider point is more that um, I think a lot of what we've heard tonight just um, shows a fundamental misunderstanding of what the prevent strategy is and what it aims to do. Um, and I actually do think that a huge amount of um, the kind of um, criticism of prevent, a huge amount of the opposition to prevent does come from those misunderstandings. So we've heard a lot about the <coughs> conveyor belt theory, the idea that prevent is built around an idea that if you become more religious, you will then go on to become a, an extremist. It just simply does not appear in the prevent strategy, is not the basis of the prevent strategy. Whenever you speak to practitioners and you mention the conveyor belt strategy, they will roll their eyes and go, oh, for God's sake, people still talking about that, because it's just not a case that the strategy is built on that. Um, prevent sees radicalization as engagement with a cause, any particular particular cause, the development of intent to cause harm, and then the development of capability. That capability is needed to go with that intent to make you a threat, but if you have that engagement with a cause and an intent to cause harm, then you, you could be, you know, the argument would be that you have become radicalised by that cause to the extent that you're willing to cause somebody harm by it. Um, and I think that really is where we, we, seem, we seem to sit often, is that people will stand up and say, Prevent says that if you become religious, you will go on to become an extremist. Actually, Prevent Training um, says increased religiosity, such as donning hijab, for example, is not a sign of radicalisation. Explicitly tells people that it's not a sign of radicalisation. Um, and I think that it's important to kind of get that across, that this, you know, these kind of understandings of Prevent are, are fundamentally flawed from the start and, and do seem to drive a lot of people's anger towards it. Sorry? Well, I, I actually, unfortunately, I have to leave in a couple of minutes, um, but I did want to bring up in the, the Q&A as well uh, the fact that um, Robert Vakaik, um, an author um, and journalist, was supposed to be on the panel tonight. Now, Vakaik um, knew Mohamed Amwazi. He'd met with him and a number of other people in his uh, inner circle, uh, a number of whom went on to join um, al-Shabaab and were killed in drone strikes. Um, and his um, story that he heard from Mohamed Amwazi, which Mohamed Amwazi also told to Cage, was that him and his friends were being, essentially were radicalised by the harassment they received from MI5, that they were being asked to become informants, that it was making them feel that they weren't um, at home in the UK, that they couldn't get a job properly, that MI5 would call up employers, even potential future spouses. Um, and Robert McKayek said that he didn't want to speak today because he was told by the university he had to sign a, an equality and diversity policy, essentially, uh, or not even sign it, just agree with it, and that that would prevent him from talking about whether or not young Muslims feel they are oppressed by the security services. Um, now, I think actually it's quite important that we spend like 15 minutes talking about that feeling that people have um, to show that we can still talk about those issues on campus, that there isn't a policy in place that stops us talking about those things, um, and that Vic Haig was wrong to say that. I want to say that it's a, it's a, it's a straw man to, that said to claim that we said that increasing religiosity is leading to, is, is, is what the conveyor belt is. It was actually um, your colleague Dibiesh that said it, not us. <laughs> so let's not. Okay, I, I mean, the one colleague on the panel and so on, I, I, I will not ask any questions of the private nature. So um, what, what Prevent does say is that there is a political ideology, not just any cause, like 
save the whales will lead to vi no, not necessarily that. It's it's very specifically Islamism, quote unquote, a distinction between that and Islam, which Muslims simply just don't agree with. Um, if you just look at the, our, our history, we have a history of political thought um, for 1,300 years. So that's just, uh, um, I mean, how, how dare the British government delineate Islam and Islamism, but that's a different discussion. Um, and they say that Islamism is a conveyor belt to, to terrorism. And this theory has been uh, debunked by academic after academic after academic. Um, the issue is we don't know what extremism actually is defined. People say it's an opposition to democracy. Or, or really, well, Jehovah's Witnesses don't vote uh, in democracy. There are people who are monarchists who don't vote democracy. If you're an anarchist, technically, then you wouldn't believe in democracy either, uh, depending on which model. Uh, there are uh, Chinese political philosophers which come speak at Oxford University, speak at TEDx, uh, like Eric Exley, who denounced uh, secular uh, Western democracy, so it doesn't work everywhere in the else in the world. And you know, he was feted as a great, you know, thinker, and I, and he discussed uh, wonderful, uh, according to the, the the audience, great ideas. So apparently, you're an extremist unless you're Chinese for you know for saying the, the, the same points. So um, people can criticize democracy, right? It shouldn't be uh, a taboo which then makes you e extremist, okay? And lastly, I just want to mention the point very. Very important. Firstly, I, I don't know what mansplaining is. Does, does the, the sex of the person matter in, in, in talking about intellectual point? But uh, what I will say is, if ISIS and RS are Islamic because they just put the word Islamic in their name, then the People's Democratic Republic of North Korea are democratic and republic as well. <laughs> All right? That's, that's, just, that's just the silliness of this. Just, I, I actually invite you to study the discourses uh, in academic works of um, terrorists. I think Bruce Lawrence wrote a book on um, Osama bin Laden messages to the world and he compiled all these statements. So an Al Jazeera journalist says to Osama bin Laden, why do you advocate terrorism and attacking the enemy civilians uh, when the Prophet Muhammad clearly prohibited this? And you know what Osama bin Laden said? He said, well, that's true, you're right, it was prohibited by the Prophet Muhammad, but the law isn't set in stone, he argues. And then he cites a verse from the Quran, not a verse that says, kill infidels or kill whatever, he said the verse for the Quran says, fight the enemy as they fight you, which he says gives him permission to imitate the West. That's his argument. These people are modernists. They are imitating Western uh, philosophies. They have nothing to do with, with Islam. As Muslims, Muslims who are peaceful, they're the ones who are fundamentalists because we f follow the fundamentals of Islam that prohibit that in the first place. Can I dive in quickly and then I'll, yeah. and then I'll have to rush off? Um, I mean, in, in my opinion, I, I, think, yeah, um, I, mean, I think completely right that BDS isn't illegal. I don't think it should be made illegal. Um, I mean, I think the, uh, the kind of suggestions about um, new laws that were coming in, I, I haven't seen them in particular detail, but I would be concerned if it would be suggested that to uh, um, yeah, kind of advocate for BDS would be made illegal. Um, as far as, as far as I'm aware, the, the cases around um, kind of advocating for Palestinian rights, for example, um, in relation to prevent, um, it's not something that would be considered in itself cause for um, kind of um, referral. Um, there have been cases where people have been referred um, over um, uh, sharing material as a result of that that was part from an organisation that has a long history of anti-Semitism um, and support for extremist groups. Um, but other than that, I would say that, as far as I know, that just supporting Palestine itself isn't enough. Now there has been cases. There have been cases of people travelling to Palestine and then travelling on uh, to become involved in violent extremism. Uh, I believe one of the individuals who's currently um, fighting in Syria um, um, was part of uh, Mohammed and Wazi's um, kind of little crew. Um, travelled through that way on a, a convoy to Palestine. But other than that, I've not seen um, anything in, in that relation. 
Okay. In terms of, again, I mean, see, the problem with this kind of strategy and counterterrorism narrative is that it assumes that the state is benign. That state, what state does is in terms of violence is not terrorism and what others do is terrorism. In that context, when human rights start getting, sort of, bye-bye, you know, when human rights start getting <laughs> sort of illegitimized and we, use, we have to challenge it. So, see, that goes without saying. So not only BDS, but other forms of anti-imperialist and anti-racist struggle that are going on, we have to continue. But simply by rejecting prevent, it would not happen, right? So in a sense, it has to be wider than that. Now, going back to a couple of points, because uh, I guess we should talk of it. In terms of, I understand, so for me, I mean, you're right about this whole idea of how identities get fixed. For instance, when you talked of gay, and it is a 19th century invention kind of thing, very interesting, uh, very uh, interesting reading on queer politics. But I understand, I didn't mean to say that it's true Islam. I was not saying that what I said is true Islam. I, I was not at all saying it. But what, let's say, UK does is not true secular democracy. By that logic, what state is doing with prevent is not true prevent. So what I was trying to argue is that every discourse, every idea is contested idea and contestations go on. So when I'm saying North Korea, it is communist in the sense that it claims to be communist. That doesn't mean that's real communism. So I would argue, for instance, that, and mansplaining was not referring to, I'll give you the specific example of mansplaining was the girl who asked the question they was talking to someone else there right now. When she asked the question and Jahangir responded by saying, I don't know what kind of pre prevent you attend, but I have been doing it for many times and I know this is what it is about. So that is mansplaining because in that certain context... His, his gender is irrelevant because they're not talking no. about women's issues. No, um, it is about it's how you talk. Like, it's how you talk to someone. There's a power hierarchy, that's how I... Well, there's a power hierarchy in terms of gender. You can't say that's mansplaining unless you mean explaining it as a man means you're rude. No, if I say no, to you that your experience is wrong... It's different experiences. Yes. And if I'm saying that, oh, somehow your experience of being Muslim and being victimized is somehow illegitimate or not as good as my experience of knowing about you, that becomes problematic, as I was saying. But, yeah, you know, anyway. uh, this is... Yeah, please go ahead. I mean, the problem with this whole debate is that we're, we're moving away from uh, traditional concepts of equality, racial justice that we've had. I wrote policies uh, in local government around race relations and equality, racial harassment policies. The victim's perception is what counts when you record. Now, the victims, when it comes to Muslims, the victim's perception is irrelevant. We have equality policies. We've had them equal opportunities for years, which say you should not uh, discriminate against people for their political, uh, religious, uh, national, ethnic, all kinds of things. Prevent encourages people to look at people and discriminate against them because of their views. It's quite legitimate now for an employer to go on Facebook and see what type of views you have before you even recruit people. And that's happening. Uh, so Prevent is producing a whole system which is discriminatory. I'm not talking about uh, uh, you know, victimization of one community. It's doing it, 60% of channel referrals are... Um, from the Muslim community. There are non-Muslims who are referred. It's equally wrong that a child who makes a comment about race should be referred to a channel program because they may end up in the far right. Uh, the other point that I want to make, my argument is not that we should call Britain first Christian extremists. My point is that if the theory of prevent and the ideas behind prevent are being applied, and its application consistently and non-discriminatory, you should be using that same thing against prevent. If you've got a government website that talks about hate and racism, then, you know, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, and Hindus, and I've studied all of them, by the way. I study all these movements. I've been studying them for decades. Um, and there's a wonderful book on Hindu extremism, right-wing groups, and how the Hindu community funds those. But if you're consistent, you should have knowledge of all these. You should be applying these uh, to everybody. I don't think it's an area that public sector workers should get into. Um, you're getting into complex reli uh, religious ideas, uh, uh, issues. The basic point that I'm making is the concept behind prevent that theology and ideology is the cause of radicalization and Violence is not correct because you could apply that to Adolf Hitler who justified everything he did 
from the Bible, from Christian ideas. Terrorism and violence is a methodology. And people will take ideologies uh, and use them to justify what they're doing. If, you, if, the, if the, the Palestinians had a nationalist idea, uh, ideology, they were still involved in violence. If they were not Muslims because of their circumstances and their conditions, they would still be engaged in violence. Fantastic. Can I, uh, I've got a couple of points from the audience um, and I'd really like to get a couple more points in. So uh, Jim um, and then a lady in the middle there. Um, I, I, I just had a question actually, and it was a lot of students' unions have decided the best response to prevent is to boycott it, to not get engaged, to make it as difficult as possible to implement. At the same time though, Jahangir said that lots of people aren't being represented in the formulation of prevent policy. Do you think as a student union it would be better to engage and try to reform and improve the event or to boycott it and have as little to do with it as possible? Can we take your point as well? As 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 you said that um, bigotry and violence often go together, so then you're implying that liberalism and violence never go together. However, but however many um, of the Tories and the Labour parties, they're creating many wars. So that's, you know, you can see that obviously it's not contradiction what you're saying. So can we have a response from the panel? Okay, I mean, um, I didn't get to um, put a response to the po previous question, but I kind of m meld it together. Um, I, think, I think that basically when, it, when, when student unions are faced with um, any, any unjust requirements, so if a, if a speaker's been invited and they say that you must have someone that challenges that, that person on that panel, uh, then either say, right, th does that mean every single speaker that speaks at this university will, we will invite someone that opposes them? Or is it only, are you trying to say it's only this person? And if they say only this person, then say, so I'm sorry I cannot do that because that is discrimination, right? W the state can't define the morals of the people. Then it becomes an ecumenical organization. We might as well go back to the Catholic Church controlling <laughs> uh, what is right and wrong, right? The state determines the laws. So, but if, they, if the government says, as a student union, could you give us some advice? Yeah, sure, do it. It's great to give advice. It's always good to give advice. You can engage in that sense. So. You don't, you don't have to follow orders, so to speak, if you think it's unjust. But in terms of the discussions that were brought up, so what represents something, what, what doesn't represent something? Well, I mean, the, the thing is, Islam is different from just an ideology of, let's say, secular liberalism or, um, or, or prevent as an agenda, because Islam is based on uh, scriptural sources. And so we have a, a, a kind of measure the scriptural sources say what they say. So either you can reject what the scripture says or you can accept what the scripture says and you can measure someone. So if you're seeing a Muslim, let's say, eating pork and saying, pork is allowed in my religion. You say, well, that's not really what it says in your Quran. So I don't see that being Islamic, right? You have an objective measure. Whereas if someone says, I do this in the name of communism, I do this in the name of secular liberalism, uh, there is difference of opinion about that. There's no holy book of that. Um, but as for the idea of what is prevent, um, what is... You're right that maybe you could say, well, prevent isn't really prevent. Well, seeing as prevent was invented by um, well, the Labour Party and then taken by the Conservative Party. Uh, let me give you maybe a new suggestion for a new kind of prevent. A new kind of prevent is, how about we just implement the existing laws in this country that prevent you fr uh, from inciting hatred against people's sexuality, uh, against people based on race or religion or um, sexuality? Uh, how about... We have measures where the teachers look out for psychologically vulnerable kids as they've always been trained to do so and put them in contact with psychotherapists, with social services, with the police if need be, which has always been the measure that police, that teachers have been uh, taught. And when it comes to religious groups and peoples who, might, who are speaking out against terrorism, but whose political views and ideas you might not agree with, you don't have to support them, but let's not hinder them. How about that being a prevent? Uh, I mean, I don't advise people to boycott or to support prevent. It's your decision. And what you have to weigh up as responsible providers is, is this something that is likely to have negative consequences and work? Is it something that is unfair and discriminatory? Uh, is it something that you should be involved in? in the monitoring and uh, scrutiny of political, religious ideas, having an all-encompassing knowledge of everything that goes on in the world, I mean, uh, and theology as well. You know, uh, people who are trained on prevent get 75 minutes. 
I've spent three decades understanding everything about my community and Islam. Uh, and, uh, you know, I can tell you, you could be uh, doing this for the next five, ten years. You will not understand the complexities of our religion and what's going on in the Muslim world, let alone the causes of terrorism. So I would apply all those tests. And ultimately, is it leading to the vi victimization and alienation of a community? And is it going to make things worse? Extremism, is there another way? Well, you know, extremism is in the eye of the beholder. Malcolm X, uh, during his time, was considered an extremist, not the Ku Klux Klan and uh, white people in society at that time. Now, Malcolm uh, had notions about white people. He said white people were the devil, an extreme idea. But imagine that you've been oppressed for 400 years, uh, slavery, the conditions that you suffered. That's a pretty reasonable assumption based on what your experience of white people is at that time but Malcolm changed how did he change he changed when he interacted with Muslims in Mecca and he saw that there were white people who were uh, there as well so my message is that even if there are bad ideas is prevent the best way of dealing with them um, you know if you are following the policies that we we have today you would not have Malcolm X speaking at a British university, you would not have Martin Luther, and you would not have Karl Marx writing his books because they are against democracy and uh, his ideas being taught in university. So think very carefully where this is leading. Uh, and there's a 14-year-old boy who, there's no real evidence that prevent his working. We've had all these cases. There was a 14-year-old boy who tried to blow up something in Australia. He was on the prevent program. And they couldn't stop him. So this idea that you can de-radicalise, um, you know, let's have the evidence. If you're saying this works, give us the evidence. Thank you. Um, very, yeah. quickly. very quickly, in terms of uh, uh, part of it, is because the discussion about prevent, should we promote prevent and all of that, it was not supposed to be about Islam or way that we have a perfect way of looking at the world. That's why we, are getting, we should avoid getting trapped into it because all texts have to be read by human beings and unless human beings claim to be as, say, as powerful as the sacred, I do think that they do interpret and misinterpret and whatever they do. In terms of the question, well, not at all. I mean, bigotry doesn't imply, I mean, look at Richard Dawkins. I mean, that's a good example of bigotry. Right? So you could have, okay, you could have, wait, no, no, my bigotry is, okay, I'll tell you, my criteria of bigotry is those that believe that their, their belief is the only one, the only superior, not only the belief is superior, the belief is also the only true belief, and those who then dehumanize others for not sharing belief. And that could be atheists, that could be Buddhists, that could be Muslims, that could be liberals, and who's denying? I'm mean, the reason, it's not, of course we have to tolerate. If you have that view, fine, I have to tolerate. But if you dehumanize me on basis of that, and I dehumanize you on the basis of my views, then we have to challenge each other. But I'm, not, I'm never saying that liberals did not lead to war. I mean, look at most wars. Most wars have been led not by liberals, not by religious people, by nationalists of all kinds. Nationalism is a bigger evil than others. So I'm not denying it, precisely. So it's not liberals. So when we pose liberal versus illiberal, we forget that all ideologies have been used and deployed by people to wage wars and dehumanize others. So I think we agree and we don't challenge Very each other on that. We had a point, uh, question right at the back. Um, yeah, Hi, okay. Um, so I'm Jessica Hill. I'm from Oxford. Um, I'm going to ask you the question of the debate is should we support it? Now, we're the Westminster, you know, we're the US Westminster, we have a colourful past, some would say. Um, so I, what I want to know, I understand the dangers. I know that the way it's being applicated is Islamophobic. I understand that. I accept that as a matter of fact. But should we, as the University of Westminster, who recently put CCTV cameras into the brothers and sisters prayer rooms, should we support this policy as the University of Westminster? Not taking NUS into account, not taking this, taking us as a student body. Should we take that? Like, that's what I want to have answered. And that's what have, no one has answered, really. Okay. So, you asked the question, now we'll answer. No? <laughs>
there's a question here. If we can get a couple more questions in and then yeah. wrap up. Yes. Okay. Um, I just wanted to come back to the point that uh, Henry made about the other speaker. What did point? Sorry. Oh, no. <laughs> Let me just. So, I, I was yeah. Paul Mohammed, so we all. <laughs> yeah. The same. Yeah, but uh, the other speaker that finished part because of the MI5, what the thing that you can discuss basically. Um, how do I know that um, such, like, engaging in such discussion is not a way to look up? Like, it's not a way to, for me to be referred to prevent because I may have views that are not obviously that are not going to be due to the guidelines of prevent. And furthermore, I think that today's panel is a really reflection of prevent because why is it we have Muslims arguing against prevent? Why didn't we have far right speakers explaining how prevent has affected them instead of why 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 should Muslims fight for their basic human rights when terrorism and radicalization affects? Oh, I can. Okay, thanks. Uh, if the colorful past, I mean, if we have colorful present, also hopefully colorful future, <laughs> because the tragedy is. Look at it. I mean, university has around eight thousand, ten thousand. How many students we have, and we have produced tens of thousands of students in last so many years. And media takes one person and causes jihadi John University, and it's not a publicity we may like, but we get that publicity, right? And in that context. What's happening is, of course, the next news comes out and they say, the university that Jihadi John went to is the university that produced this. As if there's any tangible evidence that we are the ones who did it. The reality is, of course, university, like any other university, produces 100 kinds of people, some of them, or many of them good people like you, some of them not so good people, right? So and that's a part and parcel of life. So we have to challenge that, and we have to challenge the media discourse around that. In terms of uh, prayer rooms, I will not go into detail, but we also have to keep in mind, I mean, this is, as a university, again, I'm not speaking as a university, but as an academic, I do see all kinds of people with problems. So, for instance, a student comes up and says that she or he's being, har she's being harassed by other students. And other students said, but I'm just being normal. Someone says, my rights are not being respected. Other person said that I was respecting rights, but maybe I crossed the line. So, all I'm saying, the hundred kinds of problems that we have to deal with is one of the very tiny one, one or two people going here and there. I know it's tragedy for them and tragedy for the family, but if so universities to blame, the entire society should be blamed. And that's why I use the word masculinity, because that's the one that's my problem. And going back to the student who raised the question about distrust, I do think that the biggest and the most lethal impact that prevent kind of strategy has is it takes away trust. So how would you trust me if you come and speak to me? How do you trust that I'm not going to report to you, isn't it? I mean, that's always a problem. Or how would I trust you that I'm speaking to you very honestly and actually not working for intelligence and going to report me because I'm criticizing intelligence? And this kind of distrust is what these kind of strategies often do. That's a reality. But in university context, we have to be understanding of the fact that we have duty of care to people, so even when Less. Politically, I disagree with it, mm -hmm. but I would also be aware, and I would not, I'm not someone who informs of anyone. In fact, I have said to my students, if you're ever thinking that ISIS is a good idea, please come and speak to me. I'm not going to inform of, about it, but let's discuss it. <laughs> it's a very awful idea, right? So I have that kind of discussion, which may or may not conform to prevent, I still don't know. But the OSHA, we have to challenge, but the way to challenge is not again, you're right, not to make it into Muslim, non-Muslim, or whatever issue, but to make it into of what you talked of, equality and justice. Let's talk for better. Uh, let's struggle for better way of doing that. But in terms of university, I understand all the problems, cameras. But there might be other reasons behind the camera. It might not simply be. All I'm saying, it might not simply be because they want to put Muslims under surveillance. There might be other reasons. I would not know. What do you think Can those I? reasons are? Oh well, I, I, they could be. I'll tell you in other contexts, not our university. In other contexts, I'm aware of the problem where people get bullied. And the fact is, we have cameras everywhere in the. No. no. No, no, but we have cameras, strategically we have cameras everywhere in the society. So I oppose cameras everywhere. So I'm not particularly, uh, I don't have product cameras. Cameras are almost everywhere. So I am against surveillance society in general. Yeah. So if I oppose camera in prayer room, I oppose camera in other places also. Can I, can I just add to that? Look, this is about what type of society we want to be. Do we want to be a society that uh, focuses on suspicion? Yes, there, there are, uh, there's a needle, you know, it's like looking for a needle in a haystack. To get at the needle, you target the whole haystack. And because of the layers of the whole uh, system and the uh, uh, prejudices that are operating, the assumptions, the non-empirical ideas, 
Eventually, even the straw looks like a needle. And that's what's beginning to happen. A positive society doesn't grow by uh, having cameras in prayer rooms. We've had this. In the Muslim world, we've had this, where uh, security services uh, stand in mosques whilst you're praying. We've had it for decades. This is what the violence in the Muslim world is about. We, we had under secular regimes. We've had the Shah of Iran had uh, you know, uh, microphones and cameras in toilets. It didn't stop the revolution in Iran. Uh, the Assad regime monitors children and whether they make uh, anti-Assad comments. They get referred for correction. Do, is that what we want to be? I would rather that we have the type of debate, uh, the interaction, and there's two verses, there's two things in the Quran from ex Islamic beliefs which I believe are fundamental to this. There's a verse which says that uh, God tells uh, people that we have divided you into tribes and nations so you can know each other. Uh, and sometimes knowing each other is difficult Well, you have communities that have come from different uh, values, different cultures. The, 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 the way forward is not to demonize them or to use your prejudices and stereotypes. It's to get closer to each other and understand each other. And the second uh, uh, important part of Islam is um, we don't spy on each other. Spying on each other is discouraged because it leads to distrust, it leads to uh, greater fears and insecurities. Uh, unfortunately, the last 10, 20 years uh, of neoconservative ideas, and I invite you all to go and have a look at the Henry Jackson Society and what they believe in and the neocons and the Zionist Christians in the United States, they have the opposite view. Um, they have a view which is in the opposite direction. Unfortunately, that is influencing policy makers and has done for a long time. And that is going to lead to an alienation of society where people are going to withdraw in themselves. Already we have Muslim parents, and I'm one of them. Uh, I tell my children, don't discuss religion and politics in school. Is that a way forward? Because not only are you going to be interrogated, my views may be interrogated. And I may end up under uh, some kind of regime. Uh, this will alienate people, and I can guarantee you this will not stop uh, violence. Um, this will lead more people leaving to Syria to join somewhere like the Islamic State. The things that are happening in the Muslim world, the violence happening in the Muslim world, is going to continue because there is a political process. There are causes. Europe had violence throughout its history until 50 years ago. So we can't really change that. Nothing we can do can change that. What we can do in this society, and we all have a responsibility to do, is to ensure that we look after each other and we keep each other safe. So I think during this debate, the issue isn't about Islam versus the West. That kind of discourse you, you're getting from the UK politicians these days and pundits like Douglas Murray and many others. I mean, Muslims don't have problems with Brazil, no Islamophobia there. South Africa has a percentage of Muslims that live there, um, equal to proportionately Muslims in the UK. There's quite a lot of harmony there, quite a lot of coexistence there. No Islamophobia, no terrorism, no violence, no far-right activism against uh, Muslims. Um, also, we see in places which are in the West, so you have Ireland and you have Switzerland, which both have neutral foreign policies, and we see that there is a much reduced Islamophobia in these countries compared to other places in, place in the West. In Ireland, it's virtually non-existent. So the issue isn't black and white, and no one's painting it as black and white. Unfortunately, there is one radicalized minority that are painting it as black and white, and that, unfortunately, is the uh, UK politicians who talk about the West. They use the word the West, and then they use it in the context of mus assimilating um, Muslims. So for example, Douglas Murray said, in, uh, in one uh, quotation, conditions for Muslims in Europe must be made harder across the board. Um, in Michael Gove's uh, uh, writing of the Celsus 77, he also discussed issues about the Muslim community in the, in the West. Uh, William Shawcross, who was appointed to be the head of the Charity Commission, which oversees and has been disproportionately, according to some reports, investigating Muslim organizations, Muslim charities, uh, he said, Europe and Islam is one of the greatest, most terrifying problems of our future. I think all European countries have vastly, very quickly growing Islamic populations. And of course, David Cameron, 
who uh, recently said last year that, to paraphrase, one of the problems is that Muslims are having a belief of a international brotherhood uh, which goes beyond nation, national boundaries and they should have a belief or an ultimate loyalty only to national boundaries. So what we're seeing is that these politicians aren't talking about de-radicalizing people who are going to commit violence. They're talking about assimilation, about concerns for the Muslim po population not assimilating, not adopting, not having loyalty to the, the UK. And I think this is where the problem is. Why should Muslims fight for our rights? was a question asked by the member of the audience and I, I totally agree, why should we fight for our rights? We shouldn't have to fight for our rights. Rights should be given and not have to be demanded. I would say that as Muslims in the UK and anywhere else, we are advisors to our fellow citizens, we are trusted confidants to our fellow citizens, but you shouldn't depict Muslims as the danger in this country. Muslims don't view or have a view of usurping Britain and changing it into an Islamic regime. However, the far right view this country as the canvas upon which they want to repaint it, not Muslims. The far right are the ones who want to change this country. This is their focus, their objective, whereas Muslims, we're happy to live here in peace, not imposing ourselves on, on anybody. So I think that the issue is we shouldn't have this distrust of Muslims and we shouldn't have this <laughs> demand that Muslims assimilate. I think that Muslims are um, of course, not the only people who have been discriminated. In Britain, for example, we see the same rhetoric being discussed but about uh, Jews back in 1920s. Winston Churchill wrote this article called Zionism versus Bolshevism, and he posed the same concerns of Jews as conservative politicians are posing of, of Muslims today. And before that, it was Catholics. So the issue, I think, behind Prevent is if Prevent was truly about preventing terrorism, uh, then we wouldn't see the kind of uh, bleeding into other areas and overlapping into other areas or deliberate overlapping to other areas which deal with dictating the Muslims our values and suspecting Muslims uh, of, of having loyalty issues to their, uh, their government just because they have a different understanding of, of how po politics or political systems or a different political philosophy. So I'll end with this point which is um, as Muslims and uh, who live in the UK and, and, as, and with our fellow citizens we work together, we speak together, we advise each other together, we help each other, and we should be allowed to freely profess and freely debate each other um, peacefully without being restricted, limited, or facing repercussions. And I think that is the best way forward for the UK, not implementing measures which restrict speakers from one side or another, which limit or suspect Muslims of having, belie of having particular beliefs of being disloyal or being possible, uh, possible to be radicalised into, into violence. So I think that's the way we should treat this matter is uh, let's uh, live together and not restrict each other's uh, s uh, speech and restrict each other's um, ability to uh, profess and express our opinions. Thank you very much for that point.